Okay, let's go. So shaders. <laughs> this is like shader inspiration. So why, why would you want to write a shader? It's so you can do effects like this. So when you're using Unity, 80% of what you want to do, you can just do with the, with the default built-in shaders, but sometimes you would like to do some other effects, right? Some full screen effects, some card effects like this. So, and here's a really nice distortion power effect from Ori and the Blind Forest. And all this is done through shader programming. And the other awesome reason to, to work on shaders is that shader programming is a very rare, right? So if you're someone who's, who's trying to further their career or, or trying to get a job, knowing a bit of shaders is, is a very useful thing to know. So I've given this talk a couple of times now, and every time I do it, someone tweets at me, so what they've made. So this is um, someone, when they finished the, when I gave this talk in San Francisco, went away and made this. It's a fairly subtle effect, if you can see, and it's not on loop, which doesn't help. But here's another one. You can see them ramping up the lights on the arms, for instance. So we're just gonna, the idea of this is rather than me drag you through the syntax of shader programming, I'm gonna give you an overview of shader programming, some of the key techniques people use, just simple techniques that you can use in your games, and that will give you, I suppose, a mental framework or a grounding to go and do more research and find out your own techniques and continue your shader development. So, I'll show you what we're gonna make. So I should also say card art from League of Geeks. Thanks very much for letting us use this. But we're gonna make this card effect here. So I have a, a, a card and you can kind of see that we have a light shaft coming down here, it gets brighter, and there's some sort of dusty particles coming down. And so there's about four or five techniques that go into this shader that I'm just gonna lead you through so that you can do a similar effect. But before we do that, we just start at the beginning, right? So why, with, why do we do shaders the way we do? So I don't know if you know, but Leonardo da Vinci cheated a fair bit when he did his painting, right? We kind of think he just painted paintings like this with his eye, but you know, all, those, all those old masters used to use a grid like this to, lay, to um, get the right proportion and colors. And it's a really good idea. And this is effectively what we want to do with shader programming. When we were doing graphics, we want to um, if you can imagine each of these grid cells is a, is a pixel on your screen, the job of uh, the graphics pipeline is to fill in each of these pixels one by one. Now, the best and the easiest way to do this is just to do it like da Vinci did, is to go through each pixel one at a time, look into the scene and see what's there and color it in. And this is what, um, say, a ray tracing renderer does, right? And it, and it means for each pixel we need to do a little bit of maths. And the problem with that is it's very, very slow, right? So we need to find a way to make this quicker. So that's the result of, of the pixel thing. So what we do is rather than go pixel by pixel doing some math to find out what's in our virtual scene, we step around to the other side and we look at each object in our scene. There's far less objects in our scene and we're gonna get the geometry of that object, find out where it's on the, placed on the screen and fill in those pixels. So this is what the graphics pipeline does. Um, so this approach here, it's the simplest approach and it's actually been used in some games. So Wolfenstein used this column by column. It drew a column, would look out of the scene, figure out what was there and render that texture, all right? And it, it takes the smallest amount of code. This is a game made in JavaScript, uh, 265 lines of JavaScript. It's a first person shooter. There's no, it doesn't use the traditional graphics pipeline that we're using. All it does is figure out column by column what geometry is there, how can I draw it in? But we have a, so this is, we have a slightly more complicated approach, all right? <laughs> no, it's, it's not that bad. So there's, there's a graphics pipeline. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our geometry and our, our idea is to find out where it is on screen and color in pixels. So we go from geometry to pixels, that's the setup. And today we're just gonna look, there's already two that we care about. There's the vertex shader, and the fragment shader. And that's what we're gonna look at today. So the vertex shader is, as I said, we take each object, we need to figure out where it is relative to the camera, and that's, that's our vertex shader. Passes through vertex information. And then the second step is, we need to figure out which pixels are colored in on the screen and give those pixels a color, 
and that's our fragment shader. That's the one, that, or our pixel shader. That's the one that actually colors the pixels. So there's two steps that we have to do, positioning and coloring. So what does that look like? So this is intro to shader programming, so there is going to be some code. Um, but luckily, the, CG, the programming language we use for this is called CG. It's quite simple. The reference is, is one page. It's a cut down C. And so our first step here is our vertex shader. We want to get our vertex and position it relative to our camera in something called clip space. And we need to apply perspective and projection. So it's very easy. There's just a function you call unity object to clip position. You pass in the vertex, and that does that positioning for you. This is where, if you wanted to do something like a water shader, where you make your vertices go up and down, or something throb in and out, this is where you would do that. This is where you get to play with your vertex positioning and your vertex data. And then the next step is we need to say what color this pixel is going to be. So in this case, this is our fragment shader. We're going to return something called a fixed four. And so that's, a, that's four numbers. Okay, those four numbers are red, green, blue, and our alpha value. So this shader just makes something red. Let's see that in action. It's very exciting. So by the way, this project is available on GitHub, so you can all download this afterwards. I don't expect you to, obviously you're not going to memorize everything from this talk, but the slides and the shaders are here, and so I have a whole bunch of shaders we're going to go through. Oh. And so there's our red shader. And I'll show you the actual shader for this, the actual code. So as we had on the slides, we have a vertex program, and we have a fragment program. So this is the base of all our shaders that we're going to write. Um, and as I said, this is in a program called CG. Unity didn't invent it. It was invented by NVIDIA. And so we have these two programs here. And then Unity wraps this all in some other text here, which is just giving some information about how this shader should run. I'll get more into that later. But I want to get past the red shader into something more exciting, right? So, so um, I've told you. So for the red shader, you've learned a little bit about Unity object to clip position and the fixed four. And so these are going to be the steps in our card shader. So through this talk, I'm going to go through these steps of texturing, UV scrolling, masking. These are the effects we're going to build up. So let's have a look how we get. We're going to go past red. We want to actually get this card in our base card we're working with. So let's have a look at how we do that. So I'm going to change to the textured card here. So this is just displaying a texture. Um, so let's look at the changes we need to make to, to make that texture happen. So here we are. We have our familiar vertex and fragment programs. How do we add textures to this? Well, you can see what the... This looks familiar. We have, can people see the text up there at the back? Should I make that a little bit bigger? Yeah. Um, so we have our familiar thing here where we're making the vertex go into clip space. And then we have this transform text here. So, text here. So, why do we need to do this? Well, let's find out. So, in the fragment shader here, rather than return, remember the job of this fragment shader is to return a color value. Rather than just returning a hard coded value, I'm calling this text2d function. So this is a CG function. And I'm giving it something called a main text, and I'm giving it a UV. So what happens here is we've got a, our quad, and we have four vertices. And in our vertex function, I'm just copying, I'm just going to copy over the UV value transform text. So up at the top here, it's going to be 0, 0. Down the bottom here, it's going to be 1, 1. And in the fragment shader, those UV values get interpolated. So halfway in between, it's going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So we get this whole range of values coming through. And text2d function, what it does, it just look, goes into the texture and looks up that position and gets the pixel value for the texture of that position. But where does main text come from? So that's fairly straightforward. Where does, where does main text come from? 
I'm going to flip back to Unity for a second. And we can see down, down here, here's where my material is. And you can see actually here I get to select a texture, right? So I've got a CG program that requires a texture. In a Unity Editor, I can set a texture. How do we get those two to come together? So I'm flipping back to the shader here. And like I said, the, this CG code is wrapped in our own uh, language called Shader Lab. And right up the top, I have a properties block. So the properties, this is what appears in the Unity editor. This is like if you're, a, if you're doing a Unity programming, if you do public variable, it shows up in the editor. This is the same thing for materials. So here I have something called main text, and I've given it a, a name called main texture, and I've given it a type here 2D, so it's a 2D texture. By default, it's going to be white. So this is what lets us assign the texture in the Unity editor. We still have to mar marry the two together. We still have the CG variable, and we've got the property in Unity. And so what we have to do here inside, so this is our CG block here inside here, I have to declare two variables, sampler2 main text and float4 main text st. And this just, it's just a bit of order magic stuff that Unity does. We have the same name, and this is how it gets it from a property to a variable inside CG we can do something with. So it just means any code in the CG can now talk about main text and do something with it. Okay, so um, I've told you about shader lab properties. I skipped over semantics, but transform text is the thing that takes the UV passed into uh, the vertex program and it does scaling and a tiling and whatever. And then texture 2D is the CG function that actually looks up the texture and gets the pixel value at a particular point. All right, let's make some stuff move. It's still a fairly boring card here. So we saw that our effect was I wanted to get some kind of fake dust particles moving through the light shaft. So here's the first step. I've got another texture rendered on top, and it's scrolling down. So it's obviously it's not the full effect yet, but it's going to have some other way. And this is a really classic effect. This is used a lot. You can imagine if you have water, you can have water foam scrolling over the top. People use this for parallax in the background when you're making 2D games. So this is a super simple technique, but you'll, you'll see it used everywhere. So now in our material here in Unity, I've got the base texture I was using before, and I've added another scroll texture here. And so this is, this is the, the texture that just has our fake dust particles on it. And I've also added in a scroll speed. So this is how it's changed in the material. And that appears because I've added these extra properties to the property block in Shader Lab. So I have the main texture we had before, and you can see I've added the scrolling texture. And I've added two new properties here. And these aren't texture properties. These have a range. This is a number. So these can go from minus 5 to positive 5. And the same thing, I need to declare these bridging variables inside CG. So the range property becomes a float. And now I have those variables in my code. And I can refer to them. So what's changed here? So our vertex program has got a little bit bigger. So the whole, the whole principle of shader programming and having fun with it is the vertex program has to return vertex data. The fragment program has to return some color data. The fun is in between, right? So how do we, like an all programming thing, it's a little bit of indirection, right? Instead of just passing the UVs straight through, we're going to mess with them a little bit, right? We, 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 so let's have a look down here. So Unity, our vertex thing's the same. Our main UVs the same. We're just passing the UVs through, like straight as they are. So whatever's defined in the vertex gets passed through. But for the scrolling texture, we don't want to pass the UV straight through. We're going to mess with them. So first thing I do up here at the top is I take a copy of the UVs. I make a variable here, scroll UV. And then I have this underscore time variable. This is a built-in variable by Unity, just provided to you. And then I'm going to times it by my scroll speed. So I have my UV here. I have my U value. And I'm going to make it move over time. 
So that means when I come down to my fragment program and I do my texture 2D and I look up the scroll UV, it's looking at a completely different part of the image. So the next thing is now I have two colors. I've got a main color, I've looked up my main texture and I've looked up my scroll texture, but I only can return one color. So how do I put those together? In this case, I've just simply added them together. I've done an add additive blend. This is really good for dust particles because you want them to kind of get brighter or pop out a little bit. You can also use a lerp or a mix to get, if you wanted to blend two colors together. And that gets us this effect. So we're just changing our UVs over time. Now you can do this in code as well. You don't have to do this in a shader. There's also a function you can call. So in C sharp, you can scroll your UVs there as well. And that might have some advantages if you wanted to do some extra calculations or you wanted to pull a value from somewhere else. So there we go, you've learned about the time, underscore time value that's built in. There's a whole bunch of built-in values in Unity, you can look them up. Uh, we've looked at float and range properties and set texture offset is the C sharp call you can make to do the, exactly the same thing in your C sharp code. So this effect's not quite there yet. We've got dust everywhere, yes. This, sorry, say that. They can be different sizes, um, and you might want to have them different sizes because you don't want to have your main texture might be quite large, and your scroll texture you might want to save some texture memory and make that smaller. The important thing if you're doing that is that you um, th this extra tech, this extra variable here, the main text underscore st and whatever. They're, they're going to be separate, so we can have separate UV sets and separate sizes for our textures, as long as we just have separate sets of variables for them both. Yeah. So, yeah, feel free to yell out questions if you're, as we're going. That's totally cool. So we have these dust particles everywhere. We want to mask them to a certain point. So just in this light shaft. So let's keep building up this effect. What do we get? What's our next step? Our next goal is, that's quite. Our next step, can you go see at the back there that the scrolling text are okay? I can zoom in if you need to, but you can see I've, I've done exactly the same effect here, but now it's only in the light shaft. And you can also see I've added a border here to the card, so it looks like the card has, is worn and aged so let's look at how those effects happen. So I just keep on adding more variables here. It's the same as before. So I've got a main texture, a scroll texture, and I've added a mask texture. I'm gonna flip back to Unity and show you what that mask texture looks like. So here's, here's one. So here's the mask texture for the light. So I've just used my dodgy Photoshop skills to take the main texture and, and, and just pull out the light values here. And this is introduced, introduces the concept of we have a texture here that's not visual, right? We're not gonna show this in any way. We wanna store the values here. So what we wanna do is when this texture is white, we wanna show the particles, and when it's black, we wanna hide them. So let's have a look at how that does. So in the vertex shader, that's still exactly the same. And in the fragment shader here, we look up the main texture, we look up the mask texture, and you can see there's a new concept here at the end. So I, I look up my texture, and I have a dot R on the end. So CG programming language has this awesome thing called swizzling. So for programmers in the room, you know you can go dot variable name in any programming language. You can see here I'm going dot R. So you might expect that to be a variable that we can use anywhere. But what I can actually do here is I can look up, so a color has four, tech, four channels to it, right, RGBA. I can actually put RGBA in any order and in any way, and it's gonna just return those values as a fixed four or a fixed three. So I can go RRR, and that's gonna return a float three with the three R values in it. 
I can do BRGAAA, and it's going to return those. So it's not actually a variable, it's something called swizzling. It's really useful because in shaders, you often want to get color channels and mess with them in a certain way, and you want them in a certain order. So this is a little shorthand, otherwise you have to pull the variables out and rearrange them. So what I'm, going to, what I'm doing here with, when I'm looking at my mask texture is I'm just pulling out the red channel. You saw when I showed you the mask, it's white, but really we're just going to use the, the red value of that white to do our masking. And then we have our scroll texture. And um, so what I do now is when I'm looking at my color, this is exactly the same. I get my main color and I add in my scroll color. Oh, so, um, but what I'm going to do is then multiply that color by my mask. So if the mask is white, the value is 1 and stays the same. If the mask is black, the value is 0 and it completely disappears. So that's how we do the masking of textures. And that's also a really handy technique. This is often used for, say, showing a dirt path through a grass texture or exposing dirt or badges on a uniform. You can, um, there's a whole bunch of uses for masking. And then this is the part, this clip call is the part that does the broken edge around the outside. You know, we, we get sick of, yes? So, quick question. So, we've got the swizzle.r there. Yep. So that is 64. Does that set all the other channels to zero? Or in oh, yeah, right. Yep. That's, a, that, that's, a, that's an error. Right. <laughs> that should just be fixed. Um, yeah. So it's just shader, let, shader being a CG being forgiving for my mistakes. Uh, so also you notice I'm using fixed and float. Um, that that's the same idea that you're having a certain number of numbers, but it's just about the precision of those numbers. So fixed is less precision, and float has a bigger precision. So it depends on how much detail you need in, in your numbers. So yes, that should just be fixed, and that would work the same. So clip is a function that if you pass a, a value that's negative, it actually won't display that pixel at all. It's just going to discard it from the pipeline. So what I do here is I get the value of the mask around the outside. So that might be, if it's white, it's going to be 1. I'm going to take away 0.5. That's greater than 1, so it's not going to clip that. If it's closer towards 0 or, or, or is 0, when I say that minus 0.5, it's going to be a negative number, and it's going to clip that pixel out and never display it. So those are the two techniques that get us this effect. Is anyone clear on that? Any more questions on where we got to so far? All right. So, so for masking, I really, you, Texture channels and swizzling is probably the main concept you, you can absorb here. And we're going to get more into this. So next step we want to do is, so looking at our shader so far, yeah, it's okay. We've got these dust particles coming down, but it's still very linear. We don't expect, you know, dust kind of floats around in the air a little bit. So we want these dust, you know, fake dust particles. And excuse the, the programmer out, but we want these dust particles to just kind of wave around a little bit and look a little more floaty. So let's go to the next step. So I'll zoom in on this one a little bit so you can see it a little clearer. So now rather than the particles coming straight down, you can see there's a little bit of distortion on them. They're just waving around a little bit. So this, this effect is used a lot, say, to do refraction in glass. Um, to, um, you know, I suppose, just add, add some extra interest. I mean, the thing with um, computer games is we fight determinism all the time. We fight everything so linear, and, and um, so adding, adding noise or adding this sort of effect is something that can really break up or, um, that complete strictness we get in computer, in computer games. So let's have a look at the properties of this again. So all this is the same. But the thing we've added here is this noise texture. So we've already seen a mask which is 
using a texture like a buffer. It's not using it for a visual value. Now we're going to do even more here. We have this noise texture. And I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm just going to turn off some of the channels here. So this is Perlin noise. So it's a, I've, I've gone online to an online Perlin noise generator, pasted it into this red channel. And what we get is random values between 0 and 1 when we look up this texture. And we can use that in our program to add some noise. So I've got some noise in the red channel, and then I've got different noise in the green channel. So I've got two separate, different sets of noise I can play with. So looking at our vertex shader, that's still the same. When we're scrolling UVs, we're changing the, the, the UV values in the vertex because we're going to scroll the whole thing. But now what I'm going to do is I want to change UVs locally rather than change them for the whole texture. So if we go to our fragment shader, usually when I looked up my scroll texture, I'll show you. So before when I looked at my scroll texture, I was just looking at the UVs that I had passed through that I shifted over time. But now again, I'm going to mess with those values before I pass them through, right, rather than pass them through directly. So let's have a look at how, how we do this. So I have this texture 2D function, which looks up the value for the noise texture of that particular UV value. And you can see I'm using swizzling here to get the red and the green channels. And I showed you that they had our noise values in them. And so now I have a fixed 2D, which is, has two noise values in them. The issue at the moment is that those no noise values are from 0 to 1. And when I'm changing my UVs, I want to shift my UVs in all directions, right? I want to shift them to the left and to the right. So I want to change this value from 0 to 1 to be negative 1 to positive 1. So just some simple maths here. I take it 0 to 1. I'm minus 0.5, so now the value range is minus 0.5 to positive 0.5, and I times it by 2, and now it's shifted back out to minus 1 to positive 1. So I have a value here, which is a random value from minus 1 to positive 1, and I'm going to times it by this noise amount. Um, sorry, there's my noise offset. I'm going to times it by noise amount, because 1 is a complete, you know, UV range goes from 0 to 1. So if I times it by one, I'm going to shift completely. I want to do minor little shifts in between. So I can just um, make it a smaller offset. And then now I have my distorted UV, not my straight UV. And I look at my scroll color. And instead of looking at the UV value here, I'm going to go slightly to the side and look up a, a, slightly, different, um, a slightly different part of the texture and get this distorted UV. So we've pretty much covered, and so rescaling numbers and using, using these noise buffers is kind of the main thing you can take away from this step. We've really covered everything we need now to do our card shader. So I'm going to show you the complete shader. So you can see my additive, my light's overly bright. I'll bring that down. So we have, the, we have this um, shader here, additive amount needs to come back up. And so this is what you get. So you get a shader and you have these variables you can mess around with. And you can see me trying to tweak the values to get the particles at the right level and to get the additive color that I want. Um, I could spend a long time messing around with this. And then what I'll get is a very nice effect. But I don't want to have that effect constantly on, right? So in this card, I might have a card selection where all of a sudden things pop out and I want the light shaft to come down. I want values to change over time. And this is the next step. Now we've made our shader. How do we change things in code? How do, we, how do we use this in a game when we've got some gameplay? The first way you can do this is just in code. You can get access to all the properties here um, and change their values. So there's just, you can check to see whether there is a property. When you get a, a material, you can check to see whether there's a property, and you can set the float value. I'm not going to really go into that today, because I think the the more fun way to do this is through the animator. I think the animator is really underutilized. Everything, pretty much everything you see in the Inspector in Unity, you can make an animation clip and mess with, right? And so all the people here who 
um, you know, so it's a really great way to get everyone involved. Um, people who, who aren't as confident on a code can start messing with things. So let's have a look at this. So if you look carefully here, you can see the light increases in value and then comes back down again. The noise amount goes up and down. And so now I've got a much more dynamic effect rather than just having one light shaft with one amount of noise. I can really mess with things over time. So I'll show you how that plays together. And again, really, un really underutilized. So I have a mechanism set up here where I have an idle animation which does nothing. And then I have that animation you just saw. So let's have a look at the animation clip for that. Look at the curves. So when I add a property on this card, there's a mesh renderer section here. And if I pop open the mesh renderer, you can see all the variables that I, all the properties that I've put into my shader are available for me to, to mess with. So I can come in here and click plus, and then all of a sudden, I've got these curves here which let me mess with those values over time. So in this particular animation here, I'm changing the additive amount, noise amount, and the scroll additive amount. So I'm changing those over time. And I just have a little bit of code that looks for uh, um, me to hit the space bar, and then it changes from the idle animation to that animation here. So we not, right now we have the card, it's doing nothing. You might have a selection event or some sort of game event, and then you can trigger off the animation over a period of time, and then make it go back to whatever it was doing before. So I, I think that's super, super useful. So, Hopefully that's given you a few techniques you can use. We've got scrolling and distortion and a whole bunch of commonly used shader techniques. If you want to take this further, and I think this is the way to learn this, is, is to just kind of look at techniques that are used in games. This YouTube channel at the top is not ours. I just really love it. Making stuff look good in Unity. It does what it promises. And basically what it would do is take something like a Hearthstone card effect, have a video to break down the techniques, and give you some code as well. So I think if you want to continue this and just kind of build up your bank of techniques that you use, that's a really great place to start. Of course, there's, there's our documentation. A lot of people don't realize that all our shaders are available as well. You can go to our download archive page and you can actually download all the shaders that are used in Unity, which means you've got a shader, you've got an inbuilt shader that's working great and you just want to add scroll into it or you just want to add some distortion to it. Don't start from scratch. Go grab our shader, copy paste, and add a little bit in, and it's a much easier way to start than having to you know, go from scratch and everything. And pretty soon we're going to have Ed talk about surface shaders. So I very carefully not talk about lighting or shadows or anything like that here. So this is just an unlit shader. Unity has another concept called a surface shader, which applies lighting and shadowing. And Ed's going to talk about that after the break. And then there's also the GitHub repository, which has all the, this project that I was dealing with today. So if you wanted to go back and look at how any of these things were done, please do. Does anyone, does anyone have any questions about what we've covered today? Yes. Yeah, just really quickly. So obviously everything we showed today is uh, like at the most basic level. So mm -hmm. in terms of things like um, graphics card capabilities and on mobile, desktop, and those sorts of things, like they're all just stock standard. Mm -hmm. um, Right, there, there are ways to make, um, yeah. So, so if you look at the Unity inbuilt shaders, there's mobile versions and there's non-mobile versions that do things slightly differently. But really that's just drop, about dropping techniques rather than fundamentally different shaders. It's just like, okay, we're not gonna put an extra texture in there. So the same principles apply as when you're making a game. There's nothing really new here. It's texture size. You know, you've got, you've got to remember when you do your fragment shader, that happens on every pixel. So that can happen, you know, potentially millions of times every frame. So you need to be careful about what you do. Um, and, and there are some extra K shader tricks you can do to say only execute this on a desktop and don't do it on a mobile. Yeah. We'll have a break and you come up to me and ask me questions. Um, but thanks very much. <laughs>